Chapter Eight of Soldiers, Part Two. Rainbow peered past Saber's shoulder with a curious frown. A simple cot was pushed up against the left wall, supporting a mattress, pillow, and sheet that all looked too thin for comfort. Against the opposite wall was an old wooden desk, its surface protected behind a closed rolling cover. The far wall was shared by a wide bookshelf, short enough so as to not block the light from the one window, and a weapon rack where a set of gleaming wing blades were carefully hung. What's this? Rainbow asked. Saber stepped inside, beckoning with a nod of her head. My quarters. Rainbow's brow furrowed as she followed. This is it? <laughs> what? Were you expecting gold engraving and landscape paintings? Saber smirked as she rolled the cover on the desk open. No, the bits are better spent elsewhere. It's hard for me to find comfort in too much comfort either way. Whatever that means. Rainbow walked up to the bookshelf, leaning closer to inspect the titles. On the lower shelf, she picked out a few that she recognized from stories she'd been told as a filly in Cloudsdale, such as Sunjay and the Argomares and the Siege of Pegasopolis. She pulled the latter out, a small smile tugging at her lips as she saw the colorful image of a cloud city occupying the cover. Looking up, she saw the books on the higher shelf were much thicker, with long titles written in small, blocky font that she had to squint to read. Do you read? Rainbow jumped, turning to see Saber eyeing her impassively. Uh, I, I mean, a little bit, I guess. I used to. Saber nodded at the book in Rainbow's hooves. That story is one of my favorites. Is it true? Um, Rainbow hastily reshelved the book. I don't know. It's just a myth I recognized from when I was a filly. So that story survived the end of Equestria. Saber let out a thoughtful hum. Maybe some ponies really will be remembered forever. Did you bring me here to talk about books? Rainbow asked, tail flicking behind her. Because I'm really not in the mood. Not those books, no. Saber stepped aside, gesturing to the surface of her desk. This one. Rainbow stiffened. A small notebook, bound in black cloth, rested on the center of the desk, flanked on one side by quill and ink. She'd seen it a few times before, cradled between Saber's hooves as she ate dinner in the mess hall or propped up between charts while she checked over the ship's course. She had asked Flintlock once about the book's contents, but he had only laughed and shaken his head. She took a tentative step forwards, reaching a hoof out to flip the cover open. Carefully spaced lines of clean, rigid script waited inside. She leaned in to scan the first line. Astral Thunder, 17. Place harmonica. Lost two legs when cannon shot penetrated his cover. X. She blinked, looking up to meet Sea Saber's gaze. What is this? A record, she said. She paused, looking to the window while her jaw moved side to side. Every pony I've ever had under my command. Rainbow wasn't sure what to say to that. If the look in Saber's eyes was any indication, maybe it was best not to say anything at all. She turned her attention back to the book. Sunflower. 16. Carries flowers to give foals. Hip broken by sniper fire. Velvet Crunch. 17. Volunteered along with siblings. Ear bitten off during ambush. Ivory Eyes. 35. Speaks fondly of husband's cooking. Shot in the face breaching a building. X. Rainbow licked her lips her missing eye pulsing with a phantom pain as she scanned further down the page, and then to the page after, and the one after that. Names and ages were accompanied by short descriptions of personality 
and final fates. Sometimes there would be brief stretches where as many as a dozen ponies would leave Saber's care whole in body and mind, but these were rare. In one case, she saw ten names all marked as dead, all with the same cause listed. Crushed and collapsing building under artillery fire. Still, the names went on. Rainbow shook herself, flipping through several pages in quick succession. Aqua Aura, 30, enjoys ocean swimming, interrogated to death by Griffin Mercenary. X. Ice Charm, 29, loses half of each paycheck courting mares, retired healthy after big payout. Silver Shine, 24, designs board games with trinkets found in ruins. Suit Malfunction, X. The names kept coming. The next page went blank, about halfway down. Star Trails, 25. Dives for curiosity instead of greed. Dusty Tome, 37. Writes fiction in his spare time. Sunfeather, 35. Brightens up when around family. Rainbow blinked, looking up with a frown. Where's Flintlock? Saber was leaning against the wall, still as a statue. First page. The pages fluttered under Rainbow's hoof. There, near the bottom of the first page, was a line she had skimmed over before. Flintlock. 20. Stocks up on cider during family reunions. Rainbow shook her head eyes wide. He's been with you all this time. Just over 11 years, Saber said. And all these other ponies? Rainbow looked up. There's something about being gifted. Saber narrowed her eyes, her wings shuffling at her sides. When you get a cutie mark, you're an adult. Some ponies will send you into battle even though you aren't ready, and even more will follow you. She paused, stepping up closer to look down at the list of names in the notebook. There's an island, far southeast of here. Birch Ninny. War broke out a little after my 15th birthday and I signed up. It felt right, I guess. I got my cutie mark a few months later, and they gave me a squad. Flint's mercenary company was involved too, and he ended up attached to my platoon. It was urban warfare, house to house, and artillery going off day and night. One day our unit was cut off, surrounded. Most of us didn't make it back, the lieutenant included. We were short on ponies, and there I was with a blade burned on my flanks, so some brass somewhere decided I should be the one to take charge. Nobody else protested. She pursed her lips, her nostrils flaring. Idiots. I learned a lot of lessons in that war, but I didn't pay for any of them. The higher-ups didn't care as long as I won the day in the end. They just kept giving me... <sighs> she paused, shaking her head. More ponies. Ponies even younger than I was sometimes. I couldn't leave them to fend for themselves. I had no choice but to keep going. There were a few times I came close to breaking, but I couldn't do it. They were counting on me to protect them, so I learned. And one day I stopped feeling like the world was ending every time another fresh face showed up. Saber reached over and flipped the book closed. I was a soldier by the time the war ended. There was no going back to how things were. So Flint and I struck out on our own. Mercenary work is better anyways. 
You can turn down the suicide missions and stay away from the wars. Rainbow looked down at the book in silence. She thought back to the Battle of Altalusha, where she had sliced through flesh and broken bone, thinking only of protecting her friends and the innocent villagers caught in between. Did those soldiers have their names written down in another book like this? Alongside an X and a short sentence that read, Cut down in an instant by a pegasus with a rainbow mane? She looked up at Saber. Why are you showing me this? We all make mistakes, Rainbow. Even me. Saber paused, a distant look in her eyes. We can only do what we think is right at the time, and sometimes it's hard, and sometimes we're wrong. I don't think Twyla would blame you for your thoughts, and I don't think she'd want you tearing yourself apart over it. When it comes down to it, you are the one that prevented that situation from escalating. Yeah. Rainbow straightened up as she felt the weight lifting from her shoulders. Yeah, I, I guess I am. Good. Saber stepped back with a firm nod. You look terrible. Get some rest. Thanks, Saber. I needed this. Rainbow stood up and started towards the door. She paused in the threshold as a thought occurred to her, looking back over her shoulder. I do have a question, though. Saber arched a brow. After only a brief hesitation, Rainbow pressed on. How do you deal with the times you really do mess up? She paused, licking her lips. You know, when it really counts. Saber looked away. Her jaw worked side to side for a few seconds before she answered, her eyes focused on something unseen. You just tell yourself that they were the right mistakes to make. Rainbow wasn't sure how to respond to that. She felt like she should say something comforting, but she realized that she couldn't find the words. Part of her wondered if Saber would even hear them. I'll see you for training later, she said, walking out into the hall. Fluttershy, darling, you can't be serious. Rarity gestured helplessly with a huff. On your own? In the camp? Well, um, I won't really be alone. Fluttershy looked down and pulled the bear cub at her hooves into a one-legged hug. I have Brownie with me, after all. They were assembled at the edge of the camp, which had since settled from the hectic post-battle rush into a tense calm. The soldiers were back around their tents, laughing at jokes shared in raucous voices as they passed bottles of booze around in defiance of their close calls and bandaged wounds. Some campfires were quieter than others, either due to a lack of numbers or a lack of energy. But the healers had done good work, and casualties had been kept low. Rarity had spent the two hours since the battle in front of a mirror borrowed from Countess Silky's tent, distracting herself with the careful application of makeup and discussions of diplomacy. No makeup could ever truly substitute for proper beauty sleep, but she did feel somewhat more confident about striding into Friesland and calling for peace now that she looked less like a ragged drifter and had replaced her traveling clothes with a pale blue dress more suitable for a diplomat. That confidence had begun to crack, however, when Fluttershy had told them that she intended to stay behind. But do you really have to, Fluttershy? Pinky asked, her brow creased with worry. I just... I don't think it's a good idea to split up like this. What if something happens? I have the whole army with me, girls. Fluttershy said. I know I'm not, um, as tough as you two are, but this is where I can make the most difference. She blushed, hiding behind her mane and forcing her next words out in a quiet rush. 
And if I'm being honest, I think the idea of him facing down all the mean ponies in Friesland scares me more than staying behind and helping here. Whitehorn cleared his throat from behind them. <clears throat> she'll be safe in the camp. It's well outside the range of the walls, and she'll come to no harm from the troops here. Yes, I know that, of course, but I just... <sighs> Rarity sighed, shaking her head. Bad things tend to happen when we split up. Rarity. Fluttershy stepped close, placing a hoof on Rarity's shoulder and meeting her eyes. I can't talk to ponies like you or Pinky do. I would only get in the way if I came to Friesland. And I'd hate to hold you two back from doing what you do best. She blinked, as if suddenly realizing how firmly she'd been speaking, and looked down to her hooves. Um, so just, I mean, let me do what I do best, okay? I mean, as long as you don't mind. Rarity couldn't help but smile at the display. She rushed forward and pulled Fluttershine to a tight hug, drawing a startled squeak from the mare. Oh, very well, darling. But do take care of yourself. Pinky joined the hug with an affectionate sigh. Ah, we'll be back soon. Brownie, you take care of her. The bear cub let out a tiny growl as it rolled onto its side. Pontius tapped Rarity on the back with a huff. My lady, we'd best be going before the sun starts to set. With a sigh, Rarity pulled herself out of the hug. The three friends shared one last smile before Fluttershy turned away and walked deeper into the camp, Brownie playfully pouncing on her tail as it bobbed above the ground. There was nothing left to do now but leave. And with a few nods of confirmation, the little group stepped past the boundaries of the camp and headed west. Pontius led the way, one hoof wrapped around a tall wooden pole with a fluttering white flag flying from the top. Rarity was next, alongside Whitehorn, who was wearing a clean gray vest over his shirt. Pinky prunked along in the back of the group, the wheels of her chair and the trunk seeming to beat out a cheery rhythm behind her. Each of them had full saddlebags tied around their barrels. It would most likely be days, at the very least, before they returned. There was a sparse layer of trees between the hill the siege camp was on and the open farmland that surrounded the city, and Rarity realized that her hooves were shaking as they stepped beyond their protection. Her eyes lingered on a patch of torn-up dirt beside the road where a cannon shell must have landed, picking out the stains of red left behind among the dislodged cabbages. Eerily enough, she didn't see any bodies. Pontius came to a halt so suddenly that they nearly bumped into him. She turned her eyes forward to see a stern-faced unicorn mare standing in front of them, in the open next to a field of tall wheat. She was wearing a coat of light blue with a gray and white band on each of the sleeves, a collar with several small pouches wrapped around her neck, and she wore a rifle and a harness at her side. A shield-shaped crest was emblazoned on each of her uniform's flanks, depicting a black wall framed by a pair of light blue blocks. Pontius dipped into a low bow. We've come to parley. Parley? The mayor spoke loudly, as if for an audience. She smirked. <laughs> One volley from the Frieslanders and the berries are already racing to surrender. We're not here to surrender. Rarity stepped forwards, ignoring the mare's inciting tone. We are here to prevent any more bloodshed than is necessary. <laughs> any more country blood, you mean? She made an exaggerated motion of scanning the fields. I don't think any Friesland blood stained the crops yet. You're being mean, Pinky said, her nostrils flaring. You shouldn't laugh at ponies dying. Well, Baronlanders hardly qualify as ponies. So I think I'm fine on that count. Whitehorn let out an exasperated sigh. <sighs> Are you going to escort us to the gates or not? The mare's tail flicked in annoyance behind her. She stomped a hoof, and a smaller soldier in similar gear, a Pegasus stallion, stepped out from the field. <sighs> Who requests parley? She asked. Pontius straightened up. <clears throat> 
Sir Whitehorn of Highton, Lord Pontius of Cantathusia, his wife Countess Rarity, last lady of Equestria, and Mistress Pinkie Pie, her hoofmaiden. The mayor rolled her eyes as she turned to the waiting stallion. Run ahead and announce them. I'll escort them in myself. The stallion clicked his hooves together in salute before starting down the road at a gallop. Rarity offered up a disarming smile as the mayor turned back to them. And how shall we refer to you, madam? You can call me Lieutenant Rolker, but I'd prefer if you didn't speak at all. She started towards the city at a brisk trot, and with a brief exchange of looks, Pontius led the little party after her. Their hooves beat a staggered rhythm on the smooth cobbles of the road, accompanied by the soft swishing of the fields and the whispering of the wind. They passed several simple farmhouses, though if the boarded up windows and the scattered tools and toys forgotten on the porches were any indication, they had been abandoned with the beginning of the siege. Rarity's eyes, however, were fixed on the city. A sheer stone wall surrounded it, just about twice the height of her old boutique, by her guess. The silhouettes of massive cannons perched atop with their barrels looking out over the fields of the east, like fat hawks watching for prey. The ramparts made it difficult to see, but she did pick up on a few flashes of movement here and there, suggesting the presence of soldiers ready to fire on short notice. As they came closer, Rarity realized that there was, in fact, a second wall, perhaps half the height of the inner one, but with a noticeable slope to it. It carved a zigzag path around the city, and although she saw only a few troops patrolling the top, she counted dozens of smaller cannon barrels poking out from protected firing positions. She wasn't a military mayor by any standard, but even she could tell that any assault on the city would be a bloody and a savage affair. The large wooden gate nestled in the shadow of a pair of squat towers cracked open with a ponderous groan, and a cream-coated unicorn mare swaggered out, her two-toned pink mane tied into a neat ponytail. She wore the same blue coat as the other soldiers, though she wore it open, leaving the carefully polished silver buttons on the lapel to swing freely, and had a white epaulette hanging over her right shoulder. Lieutenant Rolker motioned to the party to stop with a raised hoof. So what's the decision? Governor Rhea accepts the offer of parley, the unicorn said with a relaxed grin. Her voice was firm but soft, a far cry from Rolker's irritated growl. Do excuse my sister for the delightful entertainment I'm sure she supplied in the brief time you've known her. My name is Captain Piaf, and I'll be taking you from here. Rolker sighed. Oh, really? Whatever. She turned to trot back the way they had come, turning to shout over her shoulder. Try not to trip on your coat, Piaf. I've got more berries to kill. Rarity looked after her with a shake of her head. <sighs> Such a rude mare. And why did she keep calling us berries? Pinky asked. Am I the only one who kind of got the feeling she meant it as an insult? It's a pejorative some of the Frieslanders use for the country ponies, Whitehorn explained. Berry, derived from the name of the last Altolution king, Berry Brawl. Oh, wait, but what kind of berry was he? Captain Piaf cleared her throat, drawing their attention. <clears throat> if you'll follow me, friends, and you can leave the flag here. Although the road itself was wide enough for two wagons to pass abreast, the gap in the door was just wide enough to walk through single file, and Rarity soon found herself in the streets of Friesland proper. Skinny stone buildings with flat roofs were squashed side by side into neat rows, their roofs blooming with plant life, and the signs hanging over their doors decorated with brightly painted designs. A pair of ponies wearing the same blue coats as Lieutenant Rolker fell in on either side of the party, though Rarity noticed that the crest on their flanks was different, depicting only a white star on a blue shield. Rarity raised her head high as they were led through the city, drawing the curious eyes of passing civilians. Most of them were going about their business as Rarity imagined they usually would, with shopkeepers shouting their best deals from the steps of their storefronts and stout work ponies tugging wagons laden with supplies behind them. She pursed her lips, repressing the urge to flick her tail in anger. Didn't these ponies realize that there was an army camped just a short walk outside their walls? 
all the effort she was going through to stop the war and yet still they chatted and laughed over drinks in their open air cafes. But there were yet signs of the war visible among the peace. She saw a stallion leaving his home with the blue cloak slung over his shoulders before making towards the middle of the city, a wet redness around his eyes. A colt stood on a wooden box at one street corner, his high voice ringing out over the crowd as ponies came up to buy papers from an older stallion beside him. War with the barons, he cried. Fool Titus blames the quakes on Duchess Nettlekiss and demands blood. Rarity snorted. It is her fault. Whitehorn leaned towards her, his voice low. Well, that's unlikely to sell any sheets here, is it, Countess? It's not about what sells, Rarity said. It's about what's true. As a journalist, I can assure you that you have that backwards, Whitehorn said. A city's broadsheet's only concern is finding the most sensational headline they can. That, or to push their angle. Captain Piaf came to a stop in front of a stone two-story house, perhaps half again wider than its neighbors. She climbed the steps and slipped a key into the door, grunting as she jimmied the lock open, before pushing it open with a flourish. Ah, and here we are. My home is open to you. Rarity frowned, turning to her friends and seeing her own confusion reflected in their eyes. Are we not going to see Governor Rhea? Laden down with all your bags? Piaf chuckled and shook her head. <laughs> You're a gorgeous mare, love. But I think even you should slip those saddlebags off before you go speaking to governors. Rarity could not but smile at the unexpected compliment, looking away with a flustered titter. Oh, oh well, <laughs> I suppose we should freshen up a bit first. Piaf winked at her before stepping inside, and Rarity reached a huff up to adjust her mane before following, ducking her head so as not to catch her hat on the doorframe. The building was surprisingly spacious on the inside, with a combination kitchen and sitting area taking up the entire first floor. Colorful sitting cushions were arranged around a low metal table atop a thick rug, flanked on one side by a quietly crackling hearth. A wooden display case and tin bookshelf were squeezed into the narrow wall space under the stairs along the far wall, displaying a collection of military medals and books. Piaf stepped over to the nearest window and pulled the curtains open, allowing sunlight to stream in from the street, where the two soldiers escorting them had posted up next to the door. A very charming residence, Rarity said, stepping aside to make room for Pinky and Whitehorn to enter behind her. I suppose there are rooms for the four of us upstairs? There are two, yes. Though I'll have to prepare my bedroom before you can use it, dear heart. Piaf winked again as she sat down in front of the fireplace, throwing a few logs in before stirring it with a poker. Rarity blinked, a faint blush coming to her face. Pontius stepped in front of her with a stern frown. What do you mean to imply, lass? Piaf turned to him, looking him over with a small smirk. Nothing at all. I'm merely letting you know that I'll have to get my things out of my room before you can use it. Recovering from her brief shock, Rarity laid a calming hoof on Pontius's shoulder. Certainly we couldn't take your own bed from you, darling. I'm sure we could find accommodations elsewhere. It's no trouble at all, really. Tradition says that when dignitaries enter the city through my gate, I house them. That's how it works. Piaf straightened up with a stretch before walking towards the kitchen area. I know it's probably a little smaller than what you might be used to, but that's what you get for arriving on Hoof and from the east. If you wanted a guest suite, then you should have arrived by airship. The Harbormaster's home is much more lavish. Would you like some drinks? I hope you don't mind imported spirits. Oh, oh, I want some! Pinky exclaimed. Have you got anything fizzy? I'm afraid we'd rather not wait any longer than necessary, Rarity said, shooting a meaningful look Pinky's way. The other mare blew a loud raspberry in her direction, but relented. Rarity turned back to Captain Piaf, who was pouring a dark, bubbly liquid into two glasses. Please, where is Governor Rhea? We'd much desire to speak with her. The governor's a busy mare, love. You're on her schedule, I can assure you, but I'd be stunned if you were able to see her any time today or tomorrow. Best to settle in for now. Are you sure you don't want a glass? 
Piaf swished the bottle around enticingly. A friend in customs got this for me. No, thank you. Rarity set her lips into a firm line, straightening up. I am Countess Rarity of Cantathuja, last lady of Equestria, and I demand an audience with the governor this instant. There are ponies dying outside that wall, and every moment we waste is... Whitehorn stepped in front of her, his voice low and urgent. My lady, we are not in any position to be making demands. Rarity frowned fiercely down at him, hissing. To the contrary, darling, we're not in any position to be wasting time. I understand you're upset, but we won't save any lives by being kicked out before we even drop our saddlebags. He whispered back. We must tread lightly while we're here, and we should accept the hospitality we've been granted. Woohoo! Pinky let out a whoop as she kicked the trunk and her saddlebags into a corner. Zipping over to grab Piaf's offered glass in her muzzle and chug it down in a few seconds. She spat the empty glass onto the counter, where it bounced once before landing perfectly on its bottom. Hmm, wow, that is good! Rarity's nostrils flared as she clenched her jaw. She saw Pontius and Whitehorn both exchanging nervous glances, as if wondering whether she was going to stand down or escalate the situation. With a sigh... She gave a small nod of her head. <sighs> You're right. Excellent. Thank you, Countess. Rarity turned to where Piaf was pouring Pinkie Pie a second glass, raising his voice to his usual clear speaking volume. We appreciate your hospitality, Captain. It's been a stressful time for us of late, and I think we'd all like to get these saddlebags off our back and settle in. Could you show us to the available room? Piaf grinned at him. I'd like nothing more. Come with me, and you can all get some rest. Perhaps tomorrow I'll show you around town. Polishing off the last of her drink, Captain Piaf weaved her way through the group and up the stairs, her neatly tied tail bouncing behind her with every step. Rarity waited for the others to follow before ascending them. She didn't want anyone to see the ugly glower on her face. From high up in the sky, the soldiers in the field looked almost like carefully trained ants, dancing back and forth in a choreography only they understood. Anatomy watched with detached interest as small groups of barren land soldiers warded off gangs of Friesland skirmishers, protecting the still growing siege camp while trying to stay out of range of the giant cannons on the walls. There was a great deal of back and forth with the skirmishers unleashing volleys of musket fire before disappearing through the wheat fields or concealed bolt holes dug into the ground, and the barren landers charging in with shouts of fury, only to lose their nerve as they reached the torn-up earth that marked the previous cannon shots. Gava swung close to her, brushing their wingtips together to get her attention. Follow me. She angled her wings, falling into a gentle descent. Anna drifted a little to one side so as to take advantage of her larger sister's slipstream before following. It was about sunset now, and the airships loitering in Friesland's ports were little more than shaded silhouettes in front of the brilliant red and orange hues of the horizon. The city was clearly designed to be a fortress. From above, Anna could see two supporting sets of walls, plus reinforced strong points spaced evenly among the civilian buildings. One of the great cannons spat fire as they descended, the thunderous shockwave tingling at her sensitive wingtips even from as far away as she was, and a barren unit rushed to scatter before impact. The city grew steadily larger beneath them as they bled altitude, its blue-coated soldiers patrolling the walls with hawkish glares that never turned more than a few degrees skyward. As they dipped below a hundred meters, they angled into a steep dive, shooting into a shadowed alley before pulling up and landing. Huh. And that's how you run a siege, Gavis said. I'm so very proud of you, Anna said with a roll of her eyes. Somehow, you've managed to fly over ponies that never look up. Gava gave her a playful shove before starting down the alley. <laughs> Come on, sis. Our room's not far from here. 
Anna sped up into a trot to catch up before slowing to a walk. Did the innkeeper give you any trouble? Gava shook her head. He was one of the no-question types. They came out into the street, and she shot a brief glance to the left before leading them in the other direction. They had landed in one of the seedier parts of town. Ponies walked with purpose and kept their eyes to themselves here, and the bluecoats moved in groups of three and four, instead of lingering alone on street corners. Nobody batted an eye at the sight of a griffin and a thestral prowling through the city. They knew the questions weren't worth the trouble they brought. The inn in question was almost indistinguishable from its neighbors. The sign had fallen off its post, leaving just a wooden stick jutting out with a pair of iron rings embedded underneath. Then a drunk patron stumbled out the door, bringing with him the stench of cheap booze and vomit. Huh, classy place, Anna said. You don't belong in classy places, Gavis shot back, shoving the door open with a shoulder. What, and you do? Rather than answer, Gava swatted Anna's muzzle with the plume of her tail. The bar was mostly empty, with just a few ponies seated in somber silence at one table. The stallion at the bar, in time-honored tradition, idly polished a dirty glass while a disheveled blue-coat mare stared down into a mug across from him. Wasn't supposed to be a war, the mare was mumbling. I was supposed to get an easy job on the wall. The innkeeper grunted, his eyes tracking the two new arrivals as he spoke. That's how it is sometimes. Gavin nodded in greeting, tossing a small pouch onto the bar as they made for the stairs. It landed with a quiet jingle. Give me another week. The innkeeper scooped the bag up without a word. The stairs creaked under hoof, and the door to their room wobbled threateningly on its hinges. The room's window was boarded over from the outside, allowing only a few slivers of the last light of day to leak through, and the one mattress's straw stuffing was clearly visible through its patchy fabric. Anna stepped ahead, lighting a gas lamp waiting on the bedside end table. And you're paying for this. Gavis shrugged. I wasn't sleeping in it very often, and it's cheap. I mostly got it to store this. She walked to the far corner, pulling a pile of blankets aside to reveal an iron-bound wooden chest. Anna gasped. You found Dad! Gavin nodded. Didn't think I'd leave him lying around in the wreck of his old ship, did you? Both sisters sat side by side in front of the chest, and Anna gingerly reached out a hoof. It opened with a soft click, revealing the skull of her long-dead father. She picked it up in both hooves and held it close to her chest. Any other survivors? Gava shrugged again, shuffling her wings as she stepped away. Just bodies. Anna glanced to the side. In the corner of her eye, she could see Gava looking at a rotten patch of wall her talons clicking against the floor, deep in thought. Anna seized her opportunity and reached back into the chest, silently flipping up the corner of the soft padding within. She breathed a sigh of relief as she felt the soft, midnight blue fabric hidden underneath. Rarity's dress was safe. She jumped, tucking the dress away once more as Gava spoke up. You remember what Dad used to say about motivated idealists? Anna turned to face her sister fully, the skull cradled in her lap. He said to stay away from them. The world changes too fast when they're around and people like us only get ground up in it. Yeah. Gavin nodded. But now it looks like we're working for one. One with a lot of connections and not even a day after he gives us our first job, the island's of war. A moment passed in silence. It just makes me think is all. We've lost a lot already. Wow, is that caution I'm hearing? Anna grinned, but the expression faded when she saw the terse look on her sister's face. She carefully placed her father's skull back in its chest 
before coming up to Gavis' side, wrapping a wing around her bulk. Hey, look. We're all together now, right? Me, you, Dad, we've been through worse. If it really comes down to it, then we can bail. But right now, we need the bets. And from what I've seen of Whitehorn so far, well... She grimaced, looking away. Pulling out on him might make it hard to find work in the future. Yeah, you're right. Gava sighed and shook her head. <laughs> Listen to me. One bad hunt and I'm talking like a fledgling too scared to leave the nest. And that doesn't mean you should forget everything you've learned and go charging at Super Pony Gifted, by the way. Anna teased. She grinned as she hopped onto the bed, wincing at the way the coarse fabric rubbed against her coat. Hot fucks! Are you sure this is a bed? Is it too late to go find a nice bush to sleep in? <laughs> Make some room, Bat. I paid good bids for this room. Gava yawned as she slid into place beside Anna, almost shoving her off the side of the little bed. Anna sighed, looking up at the ceiling. <sighs> Been a long time since we shared a bed. Not since we were young. Yeah. A tired silence settled into place over the duo. After a few minutes, Anna rolled over onto her side, and Gava draped one of her massive wings over her like a blanket. A small, content smile tugged at Anna's lips as she closed her eyes. She had never said as much, but she missed the warmth of a shared bed. Good night, sis. Good night, Anna.